Um, good afternoon or good evening, everyone. It's very nice to see so many people present here in the summertime, and I can see that not only the participants of the summer school are present here, uh, but also some other people. Uh, today we are having a public lecture, our last public lecture uh, during this summer season, and it's a pleasure for us that this lecture uh, is taking place at the same time um, that our sixth summer Jewish school that is dedicated to the Jewish history and heritage of Central and European uh, Europe. Uh, this year, uh, we have participants from four countries, uh, Poland, Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia. And um, it's a great pleasure for us uh, that our today's um, guest lecturer is going to um, dwell upon some of the topics that are central to the summer school this year. And I'm sure that these are topics that will be of interest to a um, broader audience. I would like to introduce Stephanie Skier. She's a PhD student in history at the University of Michigan and a fellow at the Weiser Center for Emerging Democracy. Stephanie is writing her dissertation where she analyzes um, girl uh, trafficking and uh, briefly before the lecture we were talking about this term so it's girl trafficking not uh, woman trafficking um, and she analyzes this topic in the late 19th and early 20th century in uh, Galicia in particular uh, today uh, Stephanie is going to talk about Bertha Pappenheim and her investigations and campaigning against girl so trafficking. thank you very much for coming and giving this lecture. And the floor is yours. Okay. Well, thank you so much for having me here. I want to thank uh, the, the organizers, uh, to everyone here at the center, uh, the center staff, and especially Sofia Dayak, Irina Matsevko, and Mira Shlapok, and uh, as well as the simultaneous translator for putting this all together, which was on rather short notice. I very much appreciate it. And Thanks to all of the participants in the Summer Institute who are here and the other guests. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to share this research with uh, work, people who are working specifically on Jewish history because this is actually not my specialty. I work mainly on history of gender and sexuality and German history and international history. And this has interfaced with Jewish history, but that is, uh, I am excited to have this conversation with a, an institute on, on Jewish history specifically, and I look forward to your comments. And I want to also thank uh, Nancy Wingfield, Keely's daughter Halstead, and Robert Piera, who connected me with the institute as well, and for the to the Weiser Center for Emerging Democracy at the University of Michigan, which made it possible for me to be here. Um, so the title of this paper is A German Jewish Imperial Feminism. Beata Pappenheim's Investigations and Campaigning Against Girl Trafficking in Galicia and Other Easts. 1900 to 1913. So in 1907, German Jewish social reformer Bertha Pappenheim wrote with excitement from Tarnopol in Galicia that she had made a breakthrough in her organization's ongoing efforts to campaign against international girl trafficking in Eastern Europe. Pappenheim reported that the most heterogeneous elements had come together across political, confessional and gender differences to form the start of an organization and there was a meeting for this working committee that included the chief of police. With other destinations on her itinerary, Pappenheim did not remain in Tarnopol for that meeting. Um, and in fact, she was worried that at this largely Polish-speaking meeting, uh, quote, if I opened my German mouth, it might turn nasty. And in a characteristic appeal to, the, to duty and work against the sin of idleness, Pappenheim explained that she would forge onward, I shall not be idle and shall go other places. I have the instinct of a mule in the mountains, I find my way. But in spite of all optimism, it is possible that only one-tenth of what I predict today will come to pass. So this trip to Pactarnapol was one of, of just of several that she took to uh, a number of different regions, to, so I'll show you on this map. Um, so this is, you can see the green dots are uh, the, some of the locations that she went to. Um, 
So she went many different, like large and small towns in Galicia. She also went um, various places in the Balkans, a bit, uh, mainly just the major railway stops. Um, not as extensive a visit there, but uh, and she wrote extensively about about this. And uh, even though there was not necessarily a lasting impact to her organizing. I argue that Pak Benheim's investigations and campaigning contributed to broader debates about what was called girl trafficking, or in English it was often called the white slave traffic, or in French, uh, traite de femme or traite de blanche, in Europe and beyond. Pak Benheim's frequently cited reports were significant as part of knowledge production uh, in Europe uh, and uh, informing German and other Western ideas about various Easts and about uh, so the sources and causes of international girl trafficking. And although Pappenheim's activities as a founder of the Jewish Women's League, the uh, Jüdische Frauenbund, and her social welfare voluntary service, Women's Relief, uh, are quite familiar to scholars of German Jewry, women's activism, and social reform, Pappenheim's activities in the international interconfessional campaign against girl trafficking have received far less attention and deserve further scrutiny. So Pappenheim staged what she called her cultural work in Eastern European Jewish communities as simultaneously German and Jewish. And through this convergence of techniques, I argue Pappenheim was able to expand this German National Committee for, for the suppression of girl trafficking's mission into these Eastern regions. Pappenheim presented her distinctively Jewish-German approach in contrast to and in competition with both a British imperial feminism, which I'll talk about later on, and a French Jewish civilizing mission, which I won't really talk about here because it mostly applies to the Ottoman Empire and uh, other parts of the Balkans, but I'd be happy to say more about that in the question and answer if people are interested. So, uh, just a bit about this term, Mädchen Handel, or girl trafficking, could be translated as trade in girls, traffic in girls, girl trade. Uh, it became the standard German rendering of this concept of white slave traffic, or traite de blanche, in international campaigns in, and agreements in the late 19th and early 20th century, uh, including in two <coughs> major international agreements signed uh, by about a dozen countries in 1904 and in 1910. But unlike these English and French terms, this German term did not contain any racial or color signifiers or a, racial, or a reference to slavery or enslavement. Um, so, but in terms of Pappenheim, most of the previous scholarship has emphasized her as being a fascinating individual, a founding foremother, or an admirable example for often Western or modern Jewish women or Jewish feminists. Uh, one area of scholarship that has focused on Pappenheim is her as Anna O, oh, who was a patient of uh, the psychologist Breuer, about whom Freud wrote in his development of the so-called talking cure psychoanalytic method. Scholars have attempted to explain or reconcile Freud's account of Pappenheim's treatment by Breuer in 1882 with Pappenheim's social reform efforts starting in Frankfurt in 1888. Um, another uh, vein of scholarship by people such as Dora Edinger, uh, has presented Pappenheim as a German Jewish feminist, naming those three key terms in what has been written about her. Marian Kaplan, uh, writing a bit later, presented Pappenheim within an institutional frame of this Jewish Women's Federation, um, but without a connection to the supra-confessional and largely male umbrella organization, this German National Committee for the Combat Against Girl Trafficking, that I'll focus on. And Elizabeth Luntz has provided an excellent synthetic analysis of Pappenheim's writings, um, but she was not particularly concerned with situating Pappenheim in connection with or in comparison to her contemporaries who were writing about uh, her contemporaries' writings or reform projects, and certainly not those of non Jews. Um, so sometimes Pappenheim has been, there's been a kind of implied comparison that presents Pappenheim as unique or as a singularity without necessarily doing that comparison. Um, and this is actually, sorry? Not so quick. Not so quick. Okay, so the, this idea that Pappenheim was unique is one that she helped to cultivate herself. Um, 
that she was a singular voice without ties to any established camp. So she wrote that readers will not like her report on girl trafficking and on the condition of Jews in Galicia. She claimed a lonely centrist position, uh, one that was too modern for the orthodox, too orthodox for the moderns, too socialist for the philanthropists, and too philanthropistic for the socialists, too amateur for the learned, too uncomfortable for the indolent, and too blatant for the prudent. Um, and so man, much of the scholarship on her has taken that same kind of line, that she was out on her own with her own vision and her own views. Um, one notable historiographical move is by Larry Wolf, who included Pappenheim um, very briefly as one of this long line of German reformist travelers to Galicia. Uh, Wolf argues that Pappenheim's writings reflected and contributed to this idea of Galicia as an economically and culturally backward not quite civilized and half Asian place, which could be civilized, uh, cult cultivated, and raised up to a higher level of civilization through German, Western, or European institutions. So, um, following in the Wolf line in this paper, I read Pappenheim's writings and activities in relation to broader networks of knowledge production and her travel writings as an example of an emerging subgenre of writings on investigations into girl trafficking. Uh, I read Pappenheim within the context of German and Western European writings about Galicia, Eastern Europe, Eastern Jews, and the East more broadly. I place Pappenheim's anti-trafficking reports and campaigning within national, international, organizational contexts and analyze Pappenheim's borrowings from and navigation and dissonant and competing associations and talking points. So rather than focus on Pappenheim's singularity or her subjectivity or interiority, um, her emotional life, um, or her identity, um, so such as Pappenheim as a German Jewish feminist, this paper uh, argues um, or fo and focuses on Pappenheim's situatedness, her affiliations, alliances, and borrowings. Uh, so, to talk a bit about Pappenheim in Galicia. So, she traveled to Galicia with Sarah Rabinovich in 1903 for the purpose of investigating girl trafficking under the auspices of the Jewish Branch Committee of the German National Committee for the Combat Against Girl Trafficking. In Pappenheim's account, Galicia was a strange and unfamiliar place, despite being located within the Austro-Hungarian Empire, in whose capital she had been born and lived for more than 20 years. Pappenheim presented the land and people of Galicia as constituting an internal other, not quite foreign, but certainly not Viennese, and, yet, uh, and not yet thoroughly imbued with German Kultur. She observed the striking peculiarities of the country and its Jewish population. She presented Galicia as technologically and logistically retrograde, noting the lack of standardization or, and efficiency and uh, in the day-to-day -day operations of administrative and commercial activities. Pappenheim complained of the unacceptable conditions of infrastructure she encountered in her Galician travels from the, quote, endless rides on local trains, unquote, to, quote, wagon rides in cold wind and rain, and uh, that what passed for a good car or good roads in Galicia were bad by Central European standards. So with such comments, Pappenheim both portrayed Galicia as backward uh, and also called her reader's attention to the indignities and suffering that she endured for this noble purpose of her cultural work, thus inflating her own prestige as a brave cultural pioneer. Schools and hospitals as key indicators of what she called the cultural level, according to Pappenheim, were indescribably sad. Using biblical language to dramatize this stark contrast between Galicia and her home city, Pappenheim declared that Galicia was hell, while Frankfurt was the Garden of Eden and Paradise. Uh, for many German Jews, such as Pappenheim, who had adopted and espoused many aspects of bourgeois German culture in the 19th century, the category of the aesthetic was fundamental to this German idea of culture. The aesthetic dimension became, uh, this is according to uh, Stephen Aschheim, um, a fundamental way of distinguishing uh, civilized from uncivilized Jews, 
and a way for bourgeois German Jews to portray themselves as cultured and to portray their Eastern co-religionists as uncultured. The Galician landscape, Pappenheim reported, was rather unattractive, flat, and featureless. And she portrayed the people of Galicia in much the same terms. Pappenheim bemoaned the lack of aesthetic taste among Galician Jews and postulated that mental pressures and the terrible hardship of daily life had blunted their sense of beauty, which was quite dead. The homes of Galician Jews, she stated, lacked basic hygiene, let alone any aesthetic qualities, and the notion of a Galician aesthetics sounded to Pappenheim like a joke. Uh, bourgeois German Jewish aesthetic tastes often embraced principles of dignity and decorum uh, in appearance. In addition to portraying Galician Jews as dull and dirty, Pappenheim also presented the local population as garish and volatile, wearing brightly colored skirts and scarves and screaming and gesticulated wildly, in stark contrast to Pappenheim's understanding of proper, refined aesthetic taste and comportment. In her writings on girl trafficking in Galicia, Pappenheim also rejected the premise that modernity, secular education, or feminism had contributed in any way to extramarital sex or prostitution in Galicia or elsewhere. She rejected the claim that women and girls who engaged in commercial or extramarital sex had been infected with some kind of modern or emancipated ideas. As evidence to the contrary, Pappenheim reported that some Galician Jewish women and girls were living ultra-Orthodox, keeping the Sabbath, following dietary laws, and all other ritual precepts with greatest concern, and yet were absolutely weak in moral relations. Pappenheim explained this apparent contradiction between traditional ritual practice and lack of corporeal propriety and uh, moral relations by arguing that for these women, Jewish practice has, had become worthless, empty forms, devoid of their previous spiritual content, and that continued adherence to them was a matter of lies and hypocrisy. Um, I should add that she is an Orthodox Jew herself. Um, Galician women's spiritual, uh, spiritually and intellectually blunted condition of unrefinement, or unbildung, rendered them morally weak and susceptible to vice. Pappenheim contended. Work, and specifically work that was industrious, efficient, practical, useful, lawful, and mentally fulfilling, was an important aspect of Pappenheim's agenda. Certainly the most important factor, she argued, explaining why Galician girls engaged in commercial extramarital sex and casual clandestine prostitution, was that of idleness and boredom. Pappenheim reported that women and girls in Galicia lived barren lives devoid of any stimulation or interest. The lack of available business, philanthropic, scientific, or even political interests for women and girls in Galicia produced by lazy and lazy thinking women, Pappenheim castigated these idle girls who appeared not to strive to determine their fate and instead passively awaited their sexual exploitation by the garrisons among the lower level civil servants or among Talmud students. This is in her report. Uh, the lack of intellectual and spiritual education for girls in Galicia, Pappenheim argued, produced girls who were unable to think beyond their physicality. Pappenheim's proposed solution to this problem were improved education and work for girls, which she contended would solve the problem of idleness and, by extension, solved the whole problem of prostitution and girl trafficking. So this concept of culture, or Kultur uh, in German, was at the center of, of Pappenheim's campaign and reformist efforts, especially with regard to the East. Pappenheim's proposals aimed to influence the general cultural ways of the East. She wrote that the worth of Jews in a given state grows proportionally with the extent to which they avail themselves of culture. A 
schooling and culture, in Pappenheim's understanding, included preparation for productive, respectable employment and self-directed work, and which would include learning a trade and vernacular languages in addition to less tangible spiritual or intellect and intellectual refinement. Uh, for Pappenheim, doing this German-Jewish women's welfare work in the East meant to be a cultural pioneer. Such cultural work was not just a day job, but an all-encompassing vocation. In Pappenheim's estimation, such cultural work demanded a full-time commitment to embodying cultivation and culture in order to be an example to the local inhabitants. Such work required your entire life, your comportment, your entire being, and your ability to be a living example of what culture means and what education enables. It's quite a tall order. The purpose of women's welfare work, according to Pappenheim, was not to uh, displace one culture with another, but rather to care for the old culture and to plant a new one, namely to refine and develop the best elements of the old culture, uh, the old ways of Eastern Jews, and to instill in them the values of a new German culture. Um, and So Pappenheim had a quite low opinion of the state of culture among Eastern Jews, especially in Galicia. She stated that a man in Galicia who, by local standards, represented a, a relatively high cultural level and was civilized, would see his value decline sharply immediately upon reaching the German border. Such an Eastern migrant to the West, uh, Pappenheim argued, was considered in uh, Germany, England, or even Austria to be a mere Pole. Uh, Pappenheim's comment recycles uh, an older adage, perhaps familiar to her German Jewish readership, that the Polish Jew holds himself to be worth more than he actually is, but presents himself as lower than he is worth. So this is a familiar uh, rhetoric that she's tapping into. Pappenheim, a highly educated and independently wealthy German Jew, described her aspiration as being to elevate the population to a higher level of living among Galician and Russian Jews. So, an Pappenheim and others staged this uh, cultural work against girl trafficking as simultaneously German and Jewish. So she argued that she is steadfastly religiously Jewish and culturally German. So when she uses this word culture, it means specifically a German culture that does not displace Jewishness. And uh, one interesting mode, uh, which I can talk about more, but I'll just say briefly now, that it, presenting this Jewish Yiddish language as a German jargon or a German Jewish jargon portrayed its speakers as within a German cultural orbit and within a space of German cultural work. And especially with respect to girl trafficking, these international investigations that many people are conducting in this organization, going places like Buenos Aires or uh, New York City, Peru, like many places in North and South America, uh, whenever they encounter people and say they speak a German jargon, then they can have a, even if they're not uh, nationals of the German Reich, they can say that there's some German stake or German uh, cultural uh, work that can be done there. Um, and so this ger concept of German cultural work is a key constellation of values regarding Germany's place in the world around 1900. Uh, so, an er it builds on an earlier tradition of German idealism, uh, the which lauded Kultur, which connoted moral purpose and affiliation with certain German romanticist literary sensibilities. German Kultur was often contrasted against a British or a French civilization, with the former referring to intellectual, moral, value rational uh, activities in areas such as philosophy, religion, the arts and humanities, the latter referring to the means and instrumental rational human activity and an amoral exploitation of resources. Culture was also 
contrasted or opposed to nature and could signify a noble conquest of a wild natural environment by humans or perhaps German industriousness and ingenuity as culture included agriculture and engineering that made land agriculturally productive. Uh, and this can also include a rhetoric about a wild east. Um, so uh, this German work was particularly significant at this time as an expression of pride in Germany's achievements and ambitions, as well as an ambivalent mix of pride and a minority complex, argues the historian Sebastian Conrad. Um, and this idea of an ahistoric, unchangeable, and nationally specific character of German work often was, appeared in opposition to styles of work by other peoples, uh, including uh, some supposedly inferior Jewish work or supposedly inferior Polnisch Wirtschaft, which was a derogatory term that implied backwardness. It means pol Polish economy, but implies irrationality, inefficiency, and functions as an oxymoron. So many writers on German work present this dichotomy between parasitic and productive work. Uh, and these are all terms in circulation that Pappenheim draws upon. So Pappenheim's attitudes towards and observations of Jews in various Easts reflected these broader discursive patterns among G German Jews from the 19th century. Uh, German Jews constructed the idea of the Ostjuda as a distinct separate type, as an immoral, culturally backward creature of ugly and anachronistic ghettos, which is a familiar term in wide circulation. Uh, okay, so I'll talk a little bit about this German National Committee for the Combat Against Girl Trafficking, um, which sponsored this trip that I mentioned earlier. So in 1899, this German National Committee for the Combat Against Girl Trafficking formed to combat what they saw as an international problem that demanded an international response. So they understood girl trafficking to be a mobile, internationally networked traffic in girls and women for the purposes of prostitution. It is grown out of existing German institutions, mainly intermission uh, Protestant organizations, but there are also Catholic and Jewish organizations that are part of it, as well as, uh, in, as, as a whole, it is very explicitly an interdenominational, interconfessional organization. Um, it's affiliated with William Coote's International Bureau for the Suppression of White Slave Traffic, and there are national committees in many different countries, but the German one is by far the most active and it very much distinguishes itself from the British committee and from the other committees, most of which don't do anything at all, by this mission of information, agitation, organization. So information meaning systematically collecting information about who is uh, maybe being trafficked or who is a trafficker uh, using modern policing methods as well as uh, what I call parabureaucratic methods, so basically bureaucratic style methods but used by non-state, ostensibly non-state actors. Um, and at the same time in 1899, girl trafficking also entered the official vocabulary of the Prussian state bureaucracy with a special police section devoted to investigating and policing this issue, which it understood to be a mobile internationally networked problem. And this was not a coincidence, but they, they collect information in the same way and they meet every two weeks to compare notes. So these are highly intertwined entities, this ostensibly private organization and uh, this entity of the state. Um, part of the German National Committee is this Jewish subcommittee, uh, which actually was formed a couple years earlier in 1897 in Hamburg, the B'nai B'rith Committee, which is a Jewish men's organization, um, formed this uh, committee in response to basically modeling themselves on a London organization which was the Association for the Protection of Women and Girls. And this Jewish committee's activities in these early years were, they say, intentionally quite secretive, but including, included uh, undertaking international relationships regarding the observation of criminals. So they're already realizing this German National Committee approach of information um, and doing investigations as a non-governmental organization. 
the mm, person who was running this Jewish subcommittee is Louis Moretsky, who, who is a physician. Um, he's based in, in Berlin, but also has connections with Hamburg. He's a physician. He's a sanitetsrat, which means he's associated with the state. He has a kind of civil service status. And he was also a member of a group called the, um, the Organization for Jewish Statistics. He sought information and evidence and statistics on social problems. He thought that you need to be able to quantify a social problem in order to have a proper uh, governmental or non-governmental response to it. And speaking to this German National Committee on behalf of the Jewish subcommittee, he declared that we need to bring about a regeneration in social relations by means of work and Bildung. So he is adopting the same familiar German Jewish bourgeois enlightenment rhetoric about work and education. Um, he stated that the Jewish subcommittee's task should be to achieve education, Bildung, instruction, Belehrung, and enlightenment Aufklärung, of the Jewish population. And when he says Jewish population, he's not limiting that to just within the boundaries of Germany, but expanding that certainly into Galicia and uh, elsewhere. Um, so he, they form what they call the, the Galician section of this German national committee. Um, and Galicia was the first region in which the Jewish committee undertook this work because Moritzky stated that associational activity was unobstructed there. And what that means is that in Romania and in much of the Tsarist Empire, there were restrictions on German Jewish organizations going in and setting up institutions and organizing people. And uh, it, did, it was actually not an outright ban which is how it's sometimes characterized, but it was certainly more difficult to do that kind of work in those locations, whereas they could set up these institutions in Galicia without much difficulty from the state. Um, and so Moretsky expressed this hope that our mission work in Galicia would be eventually expanded into other Eastern European countries, so Galicia thus becomes a laboratory for this German-Jewish uh, investigation and campaigning against girl trafficking and many other social problems. Um, so Pappenheim was by no means the only one of these women who went into Galicia or elsewhere in the East to uh, investigate and campaign against girl trafficking. And this was also not something that was undertaken most times as an independent women's operation, but actually this was a strategy that Moretsky had proposed shortly after the founding of this Jewish subcommittee, saying that women are able to access spaces and do investigations that men cannot. So we need to have these uh, Zenbotenen, these female emissaries, who are usually young, well-educated women. Um, and the first three that he recruits are Marta Bea, um, Pauline Kohn, and Hulda Nordbal. So Marta Bea is only 19 when she begins. Um, and uh, she and Hulda Nordwall are both not married. Paulina Kohn is, is married, but they're all quite young. And uh, Sarah Rabinovich, I mentioned before, is a fellow German Jewish advocate of women's welfare who also investigated with Pappenheim and uh, helped to produce this long report that's usually only attributed to Pappenheim. But there were these other people, that, and they didn't write as much as Pappenheim did, but they were doing similar kinds of work. Um, so I want to contrast this to, or bring in this concept of British imperial feminism, which comes from the historian Antoinette Burton. And British imperial feminism entailed discursive formations that portrayed British national character, its national institutions, and its national culture as being the most progressive and most civilized in the world. Uh, and that endorsed Britain's imperial mission across the globe. Explicit racialization and formal colonialism figured centrally in British imperial feminism in India and other British colonies uh, as imperial feminists deployed rhetoric of civilizing and saving colonized women from brutal, uncivilized, colonized men. Despite the quite different geopolitical relationship to continental Europe, British abolitionist feminists adopted similar claims in their characterization of and outreach to Germany which British imperial feminists portrayed as being backward, foreign land in need of civilization, 
modernization and women's emancipation. Um, so, so a key British imperial feminist is this person, Josephine Butler. So her campaign against state-sanctioned vice adopted a rhetoric of abolitionism and of white slave traffic. Uh, Butler was a civilizing missionary with a global and universal mission. And in 1875, she founded the British Continental and General Foundation for the Abolition of State Regulation of Vice, which was later renamed the International Abolitionist Federation. And its purpose was to spread the abolitionist agitation into continental Europe. So the goal is to eliminate uh, state-sanctioned prostitution in all, the, all of continental Europe. Um, and Butler especially portrayed German men as misogynistic and German women as inept to resist their own oppression, a situation with Butler feared would pre prevent German adoption of her abolitionist agenda. The IAF pitied the position in which women ho holds in Germany and the disinclination of German men to see their countrywomen quitting for a moment the sphere of strictly defined domestic duties. Butler also wrote, Germans are cruel to women, and she sought to assemble a large, strong group of faithful women from all countries who will stand against a vague, menacing Prussian threat. So, uh, Butler's correspondence uh, displayed this attitude of frustration and superiority towards Germans, and reading German anti-trafficking writings and activism in the context of Butler's abolitionist imperial feminism can highlight Pappenheim's reconfiguration of imperial feminism in a German context. Against the background of British imperial feminist claims of Germany's backwardness and detrimental conditions to women, these German campaigners declared and sought personally to illustrate that German culture and German cultural tutelage were the path to women's emancipation, both in Germany and abroad. Um, so I should, I should add here that there was a German chapter of the International Abolitionist Federation, which formed around the same time in 1897-98. There was a schism within the bourgeois feminist umbrella association, uh, and several activists, Anna Papritz, Katharina Shevin, Lita Heyman, split off from the BDF, and they connect up with Josephine Butler to form this new association, which they label chapters of the IAF. And uh, so Pappenheim is not an IAF member. Um, and she makes some statements that are sympathetic to abolitionism, often through rhetorical positioning of reportage rather than direct advocacy. So for example, she writes, of course it does not belong in the context of my report to speak about the influence of the brothels and the system of regulation, but it interested me that the International Abolitionist Federation idea is beginning to gain followers in Galicia. So not taking on a position of agreement and even saying that this is outside the purview of her primary mission, which is girl trafficking, but expressing indirectly some sympathy or some reporting that others have sympathy with this method message. What, what's interesting here is that she leaves out how that idea came to be in Galicia and if she was perhaps the one who introduced it. Um, a bit later in 1911 at the German National Conference for the Combat Against Girl Trafficking, Pappenheim presented a lively protest against another speaker who was making an argument that she thought was similar to a defense of regulated prostitution and she said that she rejects all that regulationism yields. So, um, so I, I, I'm, I, would, I think that this idea of imperial feminism uh, can help us frame what uh, what Pappenheim is doing in, uh, in her activism and her writings about international girl trafficking. Uh, so for example, she, I just want to leave you with this last quote that Pappenheim argued that the fight against barbarism in Galicia is often as difficult and hazardous to the health of its kind as in German East Africa. In comparing her own ventures into Galicia with formal colonialism in the German East Africa, uh, 
Pappenheim framed her project as a civilizing mission in which, in this case, Jewish Germans traveled beyond the metropole, bravely risking their own health and welfare in order to bring about what she viewed as an enlightened, civilized culture into a space of barbarism. So, thank you for those uh, for, for listening. I would really appreciate any questions or comments that you have. Thank you. So now, now our questions and comments, and uh, we can ask questioning with John Ukrainian. So we have some more to questions. So I encourage you to ask questions in Ukrainian if you if you have those. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, so I have a couple, I have two questions for you. Um, one is, um, so much of this seems to be, you know, you use this term German Jewish and this German Kultur, but Galicia is not part of Prussian Germany, right? It's part of the Habsburg Empire. So I'm wondering, is there any Habsburg in this story that you're telling? And is there any way that um, that some of this <clears throat> German Jewish uh, committee work is part of this German national project in kind of imperial competition? And then my other question is: It's actually really disturbing how how, how um, dismissive Pappenheim is of the actual women themselves. You know, her her description and her and her discourse is very. Um, uh, of the era, right? Very um, part of this world of imperial feminism, right? Um, and I'm wondering if in your research you found any voices from the actual nation themselves who are being handled. Um, and if you, in your project, are going to attempt in any way to um, not contradict Pappenheim, right? Because that's not your, that's not what you need to do as a scholar, but to, um, to show in any way what, what the real conditions were for these women, right? Who, who actually were these women that she's, um, that she's writing about. Um, so thanks so much. I know those are two like huge questions, but um, yeah, thanks. Uh, so. Regarding the first one, I suppose I should clarify that when I say German, it is Reich's German, this is Kaiserreich, yeah. not the Habsburgs. Yeah. And that the the politics are very much about, like this is a, a Kaiserreich committee asserting a claim to Galicia. And this is especially interesting because at the very same time, there is um, there are some British activists who try to set up a committee in Bavaria. And the German National Committee uh, is very upset about this. There are a lot of letters back and forth which say, you know, Bavaria is part of Germany. Do not, do not try to set up something that is separate there. Um, but I have not found, and I think there are not, uh, any kind, similar kinds of competition. But, I mean, the, the, there is not a similarly strong like Austro-Hungarian committee for the suppression of girl trafficking in the way that there is in Germany. And when it's formed in Germany is very much Prussian Junger, people who have close ties to the state. It's made up of someone who's um, the who works directly for the Kaiserin. Uh, it's made up of someone who's from the, the Ausbergis Amt, who has been from the Foreign Office, who has been following this for a while. Eventually, they they try to include people who are in this police unit that get, that they set up or that they encourage to be set up. Um, so it's very closely tied with the German and really specifically the Prussian state apparatus, both personally and institutionally. Um, there is a lot of activity through the German consulate in uh, Lemberg, uh, Lemberg, 
is what how they call it. Um, so there, like when when, for example, Marta Bear goes to uh, Galicia, she gets um, like a recommendation through her through this not German National Committee and um, from the the consulate as a kind of passport into certain districts. Uh, and some of that is coordinated with local officials, but these are like local Galician police, like district level police. Um, I don't know if that's really answering your question, but it is. It is about it's about a kind of imperial expansion. But there, do, in terms of competition, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of resistance from somebody else who wants to do this organize, organizing. I guess one exception to that would be in uh, in Bukovina. There is a, a very active local committee, which seems to be sort of set up of its own accord that they coordinate with. But that is you know, has its own purview. Um, and then with your second question, it's interesting that you say she's so dismissive of the women's voices and the women themselves, because actually, relative to many other people writing on this issue, she is more interested in conditions that are uh, general social conditions and factors that are not uh, just who is the specific bad man, let's get a description of him and, and ideally his photograph, which is a, a different kind of investigative approach to this question, um, which doesn't really take an interest in the sort of victim side of it at all, or sort of general social factors that would contribute to it. Um, so the fact that she's looking at things like girls' education and actually writes in, in great detail about you know, how certain kinds of wage structures or workday structures may contribute to or like make, make clandestine prostitution more or less likely in a certain area. I think that's much more nuanced and sophisticated than the way many other people are approaching at this time. Um, and in terms of, sort of specific people, I have come across uh, letters of people who were uh, rescued by the German state, uh, not very many, um, and often it's because a, a parent, a relative, has written and said, um, my, my daughter has disappeared, and uh, then they go looking and find someone and then put them in some sort of home. And so there are, there are some incidents of that, but there are also much more interesting letters about other kinds of um, sexual exploitation or or exploitative work practices that are not actually what is of interest to these particular policing agents um, that come through in some of that documentation as well. Um, hello, my name is Olga Martinuk. I'm teaching history at Kiev Polytechnic Institute. And I'm really very fascinated about everything which is imperial and everything which is feminist. Um, so it was really interesting that you tried to set this connection. And, and, and I think Bertha Pappenheim is a really interesting case. Um, actually, I, I have many questions, but maybe I'll try to, to, to squeeze them into three <laughs> uh, short ones. Um, so you, you mentioned about Maretsky or uh, um, collecting statistics mm -hmm. on social issues, and I, I thought it would, be, it would be really good to see if there is any what, whatsoever statistics on girl trafficking in Galicia, uh, no matter how biased the, 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 the statistics can be. I think it's really important because as far as I can see the whole issue, it was a matter also for many exaggerations about uh, uh, human trafficking because, and it was also a ground for anti-Semitism related to this idea of the Jewish male figure standing behind girl trafficking. Because many, many, many people back in in, in the early uh, 20th century thought that women are traded against their will, in fact, and and there's Jewish human traffickers who are gaining uh, profit for that, and I, I, there's really interesting 
uh, story written by Shalom Aleichem, uh, a man from Buenos Aires, depicting this kind of male figure. And, um, and, and so it's in interesting to, uh, to have some more or less accurate uh, accounts of, of the scope of this phenomenon. And then I think you mentioned in the, uh, in, in the announcement for the lecture about policing practices and kind of demand for policing. Was there any, any, any demand in Pappenheim's uh, um, uh, writings for, for better policing? What was her account uh, about policing? Because it's also quite a, um, you know, a social gendered issue. Um, um, in um, uh, what, what else uh, I wanted to ask? Uh, yeah, and and then um, the, there's quite a quite a cir feminist circle here in in Lviv at the beginning of the early 20th century, which were Polish speaking. Um, did they know about this uh, committee? Did they know about Bertha Pappenheim's works? And did they react? Did they have an opinion? That would be also really important, I think, because in Ukrainian context we do not have this, uh, you know, some something similar to Bertha Pappenheim, you know, figure, and and uh, I wonder if though though there was any 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 account similar to this, though probably uh, most likely Polish uh, uh, speaking. And then my last question: um, Is there any? Um, uh, Russian Empire and Kiev are also in the sense that you meant, um, you know, a sphere for German influence because there were, there were quite many Jews there and, and, and they were speaking Jewish jargon and uh, at least from what you see in the newspapers there was quite a talk about uh, girl trafficking um, I, I did not see if there's a, a green dot on your map, uh, I, I, as far as I understand. Bertha Pappenheim didn't go there, but it should have been some sphere for, for, for influence in this sense. So thank you. I'm sorry if it's too many questions. Okay, great. So the first question about statistics, were there any? So, so Pappenheim is sent on this mission uh, in large part to try to compile information like that and she instead compiles much more broad kinds of information about uh, labor practices and life in general. Um, and as a researcher I find that this is not not really a helpful question to ask because if you if you say well you know how much how many girls were trafficked in Galicia in 1900 it always comes down to well what do they mean by girl trafficking and this term is so malleable that it means different things to different people and it changes meaning um, depending on who is using it so for example the abolitionist kind of uh, approach uses um, this term to signify uh, any kind of prostitution at all, um, or maybe even any kind of uh, extramarital sex that, um, with the implication that it's exploitative of women. And they use this term, girl trafficking, to reframe the question instead of one about a fallen wicked girl to be one about the girl as the victim, as the wares that are being trafficked rather than being an active agent in her own ruination. So that's what the term means for them, whereas in uh, someone like William Coot who runs this umbrella, the International Bureau for the Suppression of the White Slave Traffic, for him, it would always mean it's, it's, there involves some kind of movement usually across an international border, and it involves this international network of uh, criminals. That, so they're using these terms in very different ways, um, and, that, and those are sort of like the two major loci of how this term is getting used. Um, and it comes to mean by like about 1910, just basically evil, and so every single political party in Germany and probably in various other states are just agreeing that girl trafficking is this terrible thing, 
and what to do about it is our pre-existing party platform, which will solve that problem. So it just becomes um, a problem that people don't come up with specific solutions for. Um, so I got a little off of your question there. So you asked about policing practices, and did she demand it? That's a really good question, and it, it depends on which region she's talking about. As far as I know, she did not actually demand any additional policing in Galicia. She didn't see that as part of the problem. And she, she appreciated actually how supportive the local police tended to be of her attempt to form these committees, that usually her agenda would include getting the, the local police officials, Jewish notables, um, usually uh, non-religious notes, but sort of wealthy, influential Jews in the community, maybe, maybe a religious figure if that was possible, and potentially some non-Jews, but those, that was sort of optional. And then that's who would be at the center of the committee that she would want to have formed. Um, but she did demand policing in uh, various parts of the Ottoman Empire and in Bulgaria, uh, where she, she said that there were just these incidents where it's clear that these people are criminals. Everyone knows it's these two brothers who are doing this every week. They go to Hungary and they bring back these girls, and no one does anything about it. So in, in those incidences, she actually met with police officials and said, you know, please arrest this person. Everyone knows he's a criminal. Um, and that generally did not happen. Uh, in terms of Jewish Lviv notables, she, th those are her main point of entry into this community. It's, it's always those sort of notable Jews in the community. And, but she has a very um, tense relationship with, uh, especially, especially in Lviv with Jewish notables, um, mainly over the language issue. She does not understand, um, and she's very dismissive of the fact that they speak Polish. And um, she makes comments in her letters about, oh, you know, basically, if, if you're going to assimilate into some culture, like, why would it be Polish? Like, you should clearly be learning German. And so the, com the quote that I started with about, you know, if I open my German mouth, it will turn nasty, is what that's referring to. That she's not getting along terribly well uh, with, with these Polish-speaking Jewish elites in Lviv. Um, and she's also, there's also like a pretty strong uh, Zionist uh, movement that is resisting what she has to say, uh, or at least they're some of the more vocal ones, but like, oh, there's this wealthy Jewish woman from Frankfurt who's coming here and telling us what to do. Well, you know, we, we can organize ourselves. We don't need you to come in and tell us about how to do it. There, there, there's probably pushback from other sectors, but in terms of who would you know, write an article in a newspaper, it's generally people who are prominent Zionists. Um, whereas it's more from her own letters that you can see the sort of subtle, um, more sort of sociable differences with the, with the Polish-speaking Jewish elites, who, who are probably not Zionists. Um, oh, and you asked about the Russian Empire. So there's a, a scholar, Philippa Hetherington, who's written quite a lot about this. Uh, she just wrote her dissertation at Harvard a couple years ago, and uh, as it probably you know, it will be turned into a book soon, so that would be the book to read when it comes out. Um, in terms of Pappenheim's possibility of doing German cultural work in Russia, she has a, a wildly negative and often inaccurate view of Russia. She basically thinks that anyone in the Tsarist Empire is probably going to murder her and any other Jews if, you know, the wind blows the wrong way. This is, uh, I mean, she, she meets with the wife of the, of the Russian ambassador in Constantinople, and she writes to say, saying, you know, I am, because this, this woman, who I believe is actually an American, um, but is the, the wife of the, of the Russian ambassador, and has been very active in this issue of uh, girl trafficking in the Ottoman context, Pappenheim says that I'm you know, a traitor to my people because she's just meeting with this Russian, quasi-Russian woman. So. She, and she also writes a number of things about um, what's going on in Russia that are just clearly, clearly wrong, like they're provably false. So 
I don't really trust um, much of what she says about Russia just because it's counter to so many other more reliable accounts. And she, she did go to at least like you know parts parts of Ukraine that are at that time part of the Tsarist Empire. Um, but it was not specifically to deal with girl trafficking, it was more just sort of to look at the conditions of Jews there. And, and that's, uh, that's where she's writing that, you know, these people look like murderers and those kinds of things. So, thank you very much. It was really very interesting. Thank you. And thank you all for having come and hope to see you soon again. Thank you.